I told you, SPM is like home base, it so is, welcome. Yes, thank you. Um, so as a surgical oncologist, you've helped hundreds of cancer patients. Um, tell us about your journey in becoming a physician. So I am a first-generation post-segregation little girl from the South. My parents um, were very invested in making sure that my brother and I had opportunities. Um, and so growing up, I remember, um, I'm going to date myself just a little bit, when I was seven, um, MASH, do you remember the show MASH? I wanted to be Hawkeye. So, <laughs> so it, it, for you all, um, it, it was a show about a MASH unit uh, that sort of moved around and cared for people, and it was really a, a show about surgeons. And around that time, I used to watch it, and I, I was so in awe of how they cared for people and had significant impact. And right about that time, another dating moment. Um, we actually had encyclopedias that actually weren't um, web-based. They were actually books. Um, and one of the books that came along with our World Book Encyclopedia was a medical dictionary. And on the inside of it, I don't know if you all remember those transparent sort of layered, you could see the bones and the, the veins and the, the organs. And I was obsessed. And I, I remember telling my parents, oh, I'm going to be a surgeon. And without missing a beat, my parents were like, OK. I'm sure in the back of their mind, they were like, I don't know how this is going to happen for this young lady. But nonetheless, along the way, my ability matched my interest. And I spent a tremendous amount of time in programs that were, um, I think, directed toward uh, it's a naughty word now, affirmative action, but really were programs that matched opportunity with ability for those that might not have access. And so my um, young uh, life really was spent at going to summer camps or spending time doing research, whether it was at my local um, medical school and then I went to um, college at Georgetown. They gave me the opportunity to spend a year at National Cancer Institute. Um, and then ultimately, when I was um, in medical school at Georgetown, I had the opportunity to work with one of the most phenomenal researchers. And for me, surgery matched with cancer care, matched with research was my trajectory. It just all sort of evolved and, and came together. Fascinating. Thank you. So you're immersed in the world of cancer on a day-to-day -day basis, um, but in 2013 you were thrust into the world of cancer in a, through a very different lens. Can you tell us about that experience? Sure. Um, so in 2013, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, for me, I was sort of at the, 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 a great part of my career. I had really worked hard. I did a fellowship. I trained, um, my goodness, I trained 11 years to get to my first attending uh, job. And ultimately was sort of living a dream. And I was initially at a, um, a large university in, um, in Connecticut and then moved to where I am now at Howard University Hospital, which is where I did my residency. Um, I, I remember thinking um, I had a one and a half year old and doing all the things that I was told to do. I was breastfeeding. So at about 11 months, I, I stopped breastfeeding and was, as you know, you're lactation changes, um, you're told to let that opportunity, I mean, let your, your, your breast rest before you have your mammogram. I am um, blessed to have a son after the age of 40, um, and so I was waiting for my breast to go down, and one didn't. And so I knew in my heart parts, this is what I do for a living. I knew that there was a problem. I went through my mammogram and my ultrasound and my biopsy, and I was found to have a five centimeter invasive lobular breast cancer on the left side um, with an involvement of a lymph node. Um, and incidentally, on the other side, I was found to have a triple negative breast cancer. And so I had a year and a half uh, old son 
um, a husband that we were just settling into that sweet spot. Um, and now we had this big diagnosis that we were, were um, needing to face. And so for me, it was about making sure that I was here for my son, for my husband. I wanted to, I want to see my son grow up. I want to see him go to grad school. I want to see, you know, I want to sit with my husband and bicker about the things that he didn't do that day, you know, um, and tell him that, you know, he did a good job on the, my husband happens to be a really great cook. And so the, the meal that he cooked, you know, the, the little things in life um, that sometimes from a gratification standpoint as you're training and as you're trying to make your way in a difficult career um, gets lost. And so we were finally at that place and now we were dealing with, with my diagnosis. And for me, that meant I had to undergo chemotherapy. I underwent a um, mastectomy on both sides. I underwent radiation therapy. I underwent, an, uh, with my surgery, I also had my lymph nodes dissected. And I ultimately, because one of my breast cancers was hormone responsive, I was, uh, I was placed on uh, hormone therapy that, um, along with the side effects, um, were, was difficult to adhere to. But um, that being said, I was very blessed in that my chemotherapy, I went from a five centimeter um, breast cancer on the left to a two millimeter breast cancer with no lymph nodes. And I had a complete response for my triple negative breast cancer. And so for me, it was something that I had hope that um, uh, I could, this was something that we were going to fight together and something that we could potentially um, have a successful outcome. And so now I'm four years post treatment and I am disease free. And I am. And so now I'm living hopefully the life that I, in, in a, from a liberal arts school, I'm the examined life and trying to be present in, in the things that I do and hoping that the decisions that I make for me, my family, and my patients are, are specific and individualized. So. And th thank you for sharing your story. Um, now, were you treated at Hopkins? So your workplace. So so I, I I'm at Howard. Howard. Right right. So that was difficult. I trained at Howard, and so I tried to be I tried to get my care there. I um my my mother was diagnosed when I was a a fourth year resident. So residency is five years. Um, I actually was I did two years of, of research. So I was in my sixth year. My mother um, was diagnosed with uh, terminal lung cancer. And so I spent my, my last year sort of going home taking care of my mother as sort of a family unit um, and took a year off in between um, my, uh, my residency and my fellowship to care for my mother um, uh, before she died. And ultimately it changed my, my thought about how I was going to be a patient. Um, and I say that because I was in control with my mother's um, care. You know, it was all charted. I knew what every physician, um, what the recommendations were. It was, I never got a chance to be a daughter in that situation. I really felt that I was managing her care. And when I became a patient, that was one thing that I didn't want to be. I didn't want to be that physician who was managing everyone on the team, telling them how I was going to be cared for. I really wanted to be a patient and let go to be a patient. And I was diagnosed on June 28th um, and very resourced because all my friends are, you know, they're clinicians. And so my MRI was actually the next day. The technician who was the MRI technician, we actually started she started become she became a technician the same year I became an intern. So I, we sort of grew up together, and I was weepy because I want I wanted to cry about this, um, and she couldn't look at me. And so it was 
I understand, you know, we talk about implicit bias but this, and stereotype, but this was a different stereotype, right? She had seen me as a team leader, as being the equanimity under duress person. You know, things can be falling apart, but I was the person who kept things together. And here I was crying, and she had a hard time with that. Two days later, I was having my, um, my lymph node underneath my arm biopsy, and this cytopathologist who was in the room who was reading my slide was crying when he was, le when he was looking in the mi under the microscope because I had a positive lymph node. And I felt that I was spending so much time managing everyone else's emotion, saying, it'll be okay, it'll be all right, it'll be okay. I was like, I'm the one with cancer. <laughs> you know, tell me it'll be okay. And so it became very apparent that it was not going to be an easy journey for me to actually be anonymous and cry and be that patient. And if I didn't want to talk to anybody, that I could just pull my blanket over my head and just live my experience. And so um, I decided that I... Either, it was either going to be Howard or it would be Hopkins because Hopkins was actually halfway, I lived halfway between Howard and Hopkins. And the, the uh, medical oncologist was someone that I knew and the radiation oncologist was someone that I knew. And so I felt very comfortable in that environment. So I actually had my chemotherapy at Hopkins. I had my, um, my radiation at Hopkins, but I actually had my surgery done in California. Um, I trained with Armando Giuliano, and he is the guy who developed Sentinel Node, which is probably one of the most rev revolutionizing um, treatments that changed the dynamic for women and their lymph nodes and lymphedema and that, that um, in the era of, of um, staging. And so, I went to him, he did my surgery, and it gave me an opportunity to finally make a decision for my family to be in an environment that was just us. So we would go to walk on the beach, we would walk around Santa Monica, we would hold hands. My, my husband and I met when I was in medical school and I was always, you know, very directed very focused. And so every decision that we made, really, his, his feelings were secondary to what the next step was in my career. And I finally realized that, that I, don't, I didn't know what my story would, would be, and that I wanted to leave some, I wanted to leave uh, some stories for my family that were just about us, just about being a mom, a dad, having a little boy, walking around, having a hot dog. Oh, well, kids aren't supposed to eat hot dogs, right? Um, <laughs> having a burger um, and spending time. And so it gave us that time to really be um, together and to um, at least establish some things that were just our stories. You're making me tear up. I can't I'm ask sorry, the next question. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> So you obviously know a lot about cancer given your, your line of work. Was there anything new that you learned as a patient? Oh, goodness. Yes. So I, I've always looked at cancer care through the lens of empathy and compassion and making sure to meet my patients where they are. I, in that whole trajectory of affirmative action and sort of coming to a place of, of developing who I was as a clinician, I always wanted to come back and serve a community that was ethnically similar to myself. And so in that, I remember my very first experience. I remember um, my mentor was Dr. LaSalle LaFall. He was the second African-American in the United States to be trained as a cancer surgeon um, at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And I remember being on his surface going in patient came for a breast exam, but I had my eye, my uh, ophthalmoscope, I looked in her ears, I, I think I even tested her reflexes, and I'm sure she was sitting there thinking, why is this, you know, young intern doing all of this? I just came for a, a routine breast exam. But at the end, um, she said, can I hug you? And I'm from the South, so I'm like, sure. And she said, you know what, I marched with Martin Luther King so you could do what you do. And so 
realizing that there is a connectedness to our patients and the understanding. But one thing that I didn't realize were those moments in between hospital visits, the moments um, that you you see your doctor and they're like, well, I want you to get your MRI, I want you to get your PET scan, I want you to get um, your laboratory studies done, I'd like for you to see the patient navigator, I'd like for you to make sure that you know, you're sitting down and you're writing your questions, and then I'd like to see you back in four days. <laughs> you know, uh, for me, I did the same thing. And I actually practice at a, a safety net hospital. And so the vast majority of my patients are under-resourced, under-insured, or when they come to us, uninsured. And so making um, those requests was something that I routinely did, maybe on giving, giving them a, a week and a half, but never realizing how difficult it was in the real life. I remember going to have my radiation done and actually missing, I missed two of my radiation treatments because I had a three o'clock appointment every day, but if someone who came in really sick, they pushed my appointment back. And I had to pick up my son, um, or he'd be sitting out on the porch, you know, in front of daycare um, by 5.30. And so I missed my appointment because they were taking care of patients, but they didn't, the real life aspect practically was that I had to go pick up my son. I was the caretaker for that day. It didn't fit into it, and so the sacrifice was the sacrifice I made for myself, as opposed to making the sacrifice for um, my kids. And one thing I found um, is that many of the women that I I served, they they. It wasn't until I went through my own um, treatment and my husband was there every time, and that my sister-in-law was there, and that the family members were there. And I started to realize that there were women that I was seeing that no one ever came to their appointment with them. No one came to chemotherapy with them. No one was sitting there asking the questions with them because they had to make priority decisions for the household. Everyone else may have wanted to be there, but they had to work because if they didn't work, they didn't get paid. If I asked them to do five appointments and they come back and three of the five were done but two weren't, it was because they needed to have a, a threshold of what they could, could make so that they could pay their rent, they could pay their, their, their cost for their kids. They could, and so um, it made me understand that there were barriers that I, I never saw in my world view of cancer. And, um, that it was something that we needed to address. Mm -hmm. Now your story was featured in The Emperor of All Maladies. What was it like having a camera follow you throughout your cancer experience? So I have, had done media before and some, some of the things that you say may get construed in a completely different way when you see it on, on camera. But you know, cam uh, Cancer Emperor of All Maladies was being done by Ken Burns and we were reluctant to, of course, tell our story because we didn't know what the end game. You don't have any control of what the story is. But we felt that if we could help anyone understand how they would go through it, um, whether it was um, because they understood uh, a mom with a young child going through it, whether they saw me as a, someone who was ethnically similar to them, um, and that was taboo, telling your story out loud to people, um, or whether it was because there, I, surprisingly, there were a lot of other issues that came up in that documentary, like the mentor-mentee um, relationship with me and Dr. Giuliano, um, really resonated with a lot of women. And so um, it, it was an opportunity to give, and ultimately I think they did a really remarkable mm -hmm. job on the absolutely, other side. Absolutely, absolutely. What was it like going back to work and interacting with colleagues after treatment? Hmm. So I kind of worked through my chemotherapy. Um, and so my, my colleagues actually were very supportive mm -hmm. and, and, and very, um, understanding, um, but 
they were still, there was still a separation. You know, it was still difficult. And, and it's difficult for them now to even talk. It's like it happened, but it kind of didn't happen um, for many of them. Um, I, for my chemotherapy, I wore my hair to work, but nowhere else I, did I wear my hair. So I went everywhere else bald and living my, my truth, hopefully. Um, and I remember running into one of my um, colleagues, and they were completely taken aback that, I guess, the, 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 because people see you in a particular way. And then you become vulnerable, and then you be, and, and you become a different person in their eyes. But ultimately, I think for me, it was giving them an opportunity to understand um, what patients are like. Because I'm really an open book. If they really wanted to know anything about what happened, and I was actually given the opportunity to give a a a lecture at one of the national meetings, just talking about what life was mm -hmm. like. And was there any specific, um, I'm sure there are many, but are, are there any, uh, were there any shifts in the way in which you interact with your patients as a result mm. of your experience? I think a couple of things. Um, meeting patients where they are, realizing barriers aren't just financial, they're not just biased because of, of the diagnosis, that for me, time was a barrier. Health literacy was a barrier. Our system is set up 15 minutes for follow-up appointments, 30 minutes for new appointments. And if no, someone has never, ever discussed or understood or understands anything about cancer, that's not enough time. How am I supposed to tell them the, what their breast is made up of, what the cancer is made up of, what our, what our goals are, what are your options, what are all the things that, that we need for you to do, and why? Because what I found is that when patients had the information for me, they've been much more likely to follow through because I've met them where they are. I, un they understand that there is a goal that we're trying to come together. And so partnering um, is a big thing for me. And then secondly, one of the things that I've learned through my um, experience is that one of my clinicians didn't know that I was a physician um, when they saw me and was very, um, it was a different experience. It was not as respectful. Um, it was not as um, grounded in my understanding. It was very um, directed from one side of the conversation. Um, and out of that, I had a really horrible outcome in, in, in that I had a chest wall infection that that evolved into an SICU sepsis and, and ultimately something that probably didn't need to happen if I was tired, you know, at the end of chemotherapy, radiation, surgery. And I'm, I, you know, oftentimes I don't talk about it because I felt ashamed that I let someone treat me this way. And because I know that if it were me, it would not be the way I would treat patients. But I was like, well, you know, Maybe two days is okay. Because this person said, on Friday, I had pus coming out of my incision. And he said, well, you know what? You'll be okay. Just take your antibiotics. I'll see you, and we'll, we'll do this on Monday. Because it was 4 o'clock on Friday afternoon. Um, and I am so ashamed that, and I shouldn't be as a patient, but I am. Because I know better than that. But ultimately, the next day, I woke up, I was like, I just cannot get out of bed. And ultimately, my blood pressure was, when I got to the emergency department, was 90. And that, that um, uh, my heart rate was high. And my, there was definitely, um, it, it wasn't an expected outcome. And it's unfortunate, because throughout the entire thing, I'd been such an advocate for myself. And my family was such an advocate for, my, for, for me. But I think we kind of let our guard down. And so one of the things I, I realized is that advocacy is such, so important, not only for patients, not only for the um, uh, advocates that manage patients, but it's a responsibility for us as physicians. It's responsibility for me to teach the next generation that your actions, your words, your advocacy has power. Um, and what you say to patients and what you do to patients may um, change the way that they interact with healthcare forever. And so understanding that in the bigger picture, yes, 
it was one phone call, and I likely, I'm sure the expected outcome was that I would be able to make it to um, Monday and I would be fine. But in the bigger picture, he didn't ask me, how are you really doing? How are you really feeling? And that's one of the things that I think now, I spend more time with my patients, so I developed a different clinic setting, so time is not a barrier for patients. Um, it's the shorter patients and all of their experts come to them so that they are seen and only have to take off a half of a day as opposed to five different days. Um, I have made it uh, available on my business card. My business card actually has my cell phone number on it and my email, so they text me, they can call me, they can email me if they have any questions, so they have access. That's unfortunately something that I saw when I was in fellowship. My fellowship was in um, Santa Monica. We treated patients from Malibu, Beverly Hills, and, and the like, which is a different population than I treat now. But one of the things that I noticed um, was complete and total access for those patients with their clinicians. But when I saw patients um, in a different setting when they were under-resourced, that was not an established um, uh, standard. And so one of the things I've learned is that patients um, deserve to have that sense of, of trust and that sense of a safety net um, and that if they need to get to me, that they absolutely can, can do that. Right, and Grace, earlier you mentioned uh, that repository of, of things that were working really well that we had to collect. Well, there's an example of you know, changing the practice setting to accommodate patients, so that we'll have to highlight that in the repository when we create it. So as we close this session, um, do you have an actionable tip for clinicians that are looking to better partner uh, with their patients and also a tip for patients looking to better partner with their physicians uh, that you could leave the audience with? So I think from a clinician standpoint, realizing that you're trying to partner, you know, the, the realizing that the goal is partnering with your, your patient, that's sometimes a very different um, concept and a very difficult relationship for some of my peers. I, unfortunately, you talk about stories, I have a, a, a peer who told me they didn't want to hear their patient stories because they could not um, bear working every day knowing the intricate details. That is so counter to, I was completely dumbfounded because I, that's so counter to why I went into medicine. I went into to take care of patients and to, to make sure that they are cared for well in an evidence-based way. And so, uh, Number one, I think it is making sure that, that clinicians know that it's about partnering. Two, giving patients the space to tell what's going on with them and not jumping in as they're beginning to tell their story because it's, it, you might feel like you're getting a little behind in your schedule or in your um, overall um, day. Um, making sure that patients understand that you want what you all want together. Um, I have had the real um, pleasure and the honor of taking care of patients that I think in other settings would have been non-compliant because it took me 30 calls for them to get in the office or it took me them coming to their surgery, um, scheduled surgery with PCP on board um, and not being able to get their surgery. Um, but getting them to a point where we could do that and having them on the other side being disease free, taking care of their four or five children and uh, making sure that their lives are, are, are really well respected and their goals are respected and that we, we have those things. From a, a patient standpoint, um, I'd have to say the advocacy is important to be able to feel like you do have a voice and your voice matters. Um, and that if you have a question um, and, or if you want a second opinion and that offends your clinician, then that's not the right clinician for you. Um, and I think that it is important that we spend a tremendous amount of time in health literacy because if you know what it is that we're trying to accomplish, 
I know where you're sort of coming from, and we can meet you and get you to where we need to be. I found that those patients absolutely adhere and are concordant in their, their care, um, far greater than if we are dictating and then just moving on to the next patient. Absolutely. I'll open up, up to the audience. Uh, does anyone have any questions? If you can step up to the mics, that would be great. Or the mic. I thought there were two, but there's just one. So, so Matt, Matthew, uh, amazing presentation. I, I have a kind of quasi-ridiculous comment, but it's also relevant to the last panel. So I was at a session in Australia earlier this year, and the, there was a designer there, really cool guy called Matui Bush, had long hair and was completely wild, and he was working for an oncology center in Victoria, in Melbourne. And, in, and it kind of reflects everything we said. In the waiting room, they used to sit in rows and look at the staff who were calling them to come for their surgery. And the staff hated it, the patients hated it, everybody hated it. He took that room, he blew it apart, he opened up a coffee bar in there, he brought in dogs from the local Humane Society, I mean, crazy stuff. And what they found was that the patients were much, much happy, even though they were still waiting two hours to get to their appointment, all this stuff going on. And the staff, who had been sort of feeling surveyed by the patients and bullied by their supervisors and all this kind of stuff, actually reported on their staff satisfaction. They have much, you know, they were much happier. They far fewer uh, they didn't feel bullied. They, they felt better. And they felt like they were a team with their patients. And I don't know if, you know, puppies are the answer to everything, but come on, what, <laughs> but, what you, but what you were saying about, you know, the, the, the attitude of the doctor who didn't know you were also a doctor, right. you know, and the attitude of those, those people in the lab who closed five minutes early or ten minutes mm -hmm. early, I don't know how we do that, but, but maybe it's puppies of the answer. Maybe it's, we've got to think fundamentally about how we redesign the entire system because I'd love you to say, the question here is, I'd love you to say a bit more about how did you get to changing your system where you now have patients in one place and all the different doctors and, and, and clinicians come to them. Say a bit about what you had to do there because it's kind of like, you know, did you bring in puppies as well? <laughs> now I might bring in puppies. I like that idea. Um, I'm, I'm very lucky to uh, be supported by a chair that believes that I have value and I bring value to the institution. Um, part of what has been my value is patient engagement. I not, one of the things that I do um, uh, monthly is a free um, breast care um, clinic on, it's held at 6.30 on fr uh, Saturday mornings and patients get their breast exam by experts, they get their digital mammography and they get breakfast and they get all, you know, they, we bring in like last month we brought in a makeup artist because some women have, you know, I am a girly girl from the South, but some women have never used any makeup or never had the option or the resources to do it. And so we try to um, ask our patients, what would they like? You know, how can we do? We do um, massage every now and then. And so it really is partnering um, with the patients. And I think one of the other things you asked that I really want to put in that I didn't say is we all learn differently. And so thinking that speaking to someone when they're a visual learner. I'm a visual learner. I need to see it. Um, and so that's one of the things our patients ask. And we partnered with a, um, a company called Context Media. And so now there are all of these, uh, each room in my office has a 3D um, illustrator that allows me to, to show the organ system to show the layers. Like for instance, I had a patient said, no one's ever told me what my breast, what's inside my breast. I've never, I mean, you take for granted that people did that in, in, in sixth grade or, or whatever. But I have many patients that have no clue about how the, the basics of their own body fits in with what a cancer is. So learning how patients um, learn and, and and enriching for that as well, I think, is important. Um, if you were cloned, would be fine. Um, <laughs> I, I want to raise kind of a theoretical con construct from a sociologist mm -hmm. and then um, suggest showers as the remedy. Um, Irving Goffman <clears throat> was one of the great American sociologists, and he wrote a very unpleasant book called Asylums. Mm -hmm in which he coined the notion of a total institution. And that book was about um, insane asylums in those days, now we call them mental hospitals, concentration camps and prisons. 
And he said the way that people stayed sane in those institutions, he called them total institutions, and they were populated by people who decidedly didn't want to be there and by people who were putatively taking care of them. Um, the way they stayed sane was by forming two separate societies. So the prisoners would group and keep one another hopefully together and the wardens would group and hopefully keep themselves together. And we wrote a paper actually in the 1980s saying that hospitals weren't so different. That if you walked around a ward, you saw the patients in their rooms with their johnnies sometimes flapping open, talking to one another, and the nurses and the doctors in the middle of that ward them talking to one another, but never the twain should meet. I, I experienced that. I had a lung abscess for some damn reason. And I had to walk around my hospital, which I'd been in by then about 30 years, pushing um, my chest tubes on a cart. Oh, wow. And as I walked, walked around the ward, it was absolutely fascinating. The patients and their family members would stop me and say, hey, how are you doing? You look pretty good today. And the doctors and the nurses would whiz by me without even seeing me. I was an invisible person. Um, so how do you break down that invisible wall? That's actually shaped much of my work. Um, ever since I read that book. Um, I think the answer is showers. And what I mean by that, we brought into our hospital a, um, a health promotion facility. We have a gym and we have showers. And I yelled and, and screamed loud and hard and finally wanted, and I said that not only should the staff be able to use it, but so should our patients. The great leveler is when you take a shower with a patient. <laughs> And then, and then all those walls disappear, right? Right. So I would prescribe showers for the future of healthcare as a um, cure for healthcare. That's novel and innovative. Um, I'd, I'd have to say, uh, in my sphere, you know, working hard to have a sphere of influence. Um, but I think it, for me, it starts with students. Every student who comes through the College of Medicine at Howard comes through my rotation. And so we are, my focus is making sure, I'm not trying to recruit surgeons, I think that there are enough surgeons in my department that can do that, but making sure that patients, I mean, students understand empathy and compassion and respectful care of patients um, and making sure that they understand that patients are, don't fall out of the sky. They have a, a you know, I, I believe in biopsychosocial. It's not just their body, it's their story. It's everything about them. And so you have to treat them from a bigger picture, a holistic perspective. And hopefully, even if it doesn't resonate, of course, when they're walking through, maybe it'll resonate when they're a, a, a resident or a fellow, or I'm hoping will resonate when they are a attending and they realize that the patients, and the, it's an honor to take care of patients. And when you think about um, some of the things that you tell your clinician, it may be the only person in the entire world that you actually tell that information to. So we should be honored to be able to take care of patients and not try to think of it. That's my 15 minute block from 11.15 to 11.30. But that's Mr. Johnson who actually has you know, two kids and he wants to show you a picture of his garden and he brings you in, a, you know, his wife brings in a cake that she's made. That's really kind of where we're going to and I think talking to and, and engaging students and, uh, and residents from that level, I think will probably be the biggest sphere of influence that I'll have. But showers, I think that's a great thing. <laughs> that's brilliant. Uh, three more questions, and then we'll go into break. I absolutely loved your story, Dr. Wilson, and Thank I think you. the power of the patient's story is, is exemplified by what you shared with us today. Now that being said, I think every, I'm, I'm wondering if every clinician in here is now cringing because now they have open notes on their to-do list discussing cost transparency and now listening to patient stories. Um, clinician burnout and the suicide rates are a public health crisis. So being realistic, what else can doctors do to listen to patient stories? Does it have to be the doctor? Do you use nurses or social workers? Or, or what else can we do so it's more of a team effort and not another thing that the clinician needs to do? And, and I think the, the key is that you 
actually have a population of patients that you care for, and it's our job to design uh, the best possible environment for your patient population. My population is best served by our nurse practitioner, our patient navigator, our medical assistant, the environment that we set up um, of a um, very nurturing environment, very loving, lots of hugs. That, But that may not be something that uh, in, in um, Santa Monica that would fly. That's, that's a different practice. And so understanding your practice and the needs of your practice, I think, are, are key. For me, it's difficult to do um, a lot of electronic medical records while I'm talking to a patient because oftentimes patients will say, you seem a little more distracted by the computer uh, than, you know, they uh, periodically will make that, that, um, that comment. So I stopped doing that. So it adds, yes, it, I, I take notes. It adds two more hours to my day because I have to do my notes right afterward. But I know that my patients feel engaged because they, that I'm looking at them and I'm not sort of taking their time that they have there. Because patients, for whatever um, uh, reasons that they come in, really come in oftentimes to get an understanding of what they should do next and how we can work together. And I, I found that, that that's the, the, has been the best possible relationship. And so my, my goal is not really cookie cutter, but really designing your, your own um, uh, plan, depending upon what resources you have. Thank you. Thank you. That's a perfect segue for me. Um, first of all, thank you for sharing your journey, because I took a similar one. Okay. And uh, I want to say that I hear a lot of people talking about goals and barriers and so on. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I learned um, through work was care plans and how mm -hmm. important they are. And that brings in the care team, that brings in um, distributing the workload, and most importantly, capturing the patient's goals, the patient's barriers, the patient's preferences. And I really think we have a framework to solve a lot of this that we don't use. And I was sort of stunned that even in my own case, I didn't have a care plan and I was so sad. And, so, and I, I think you bring up a really great point. There are a couple of things about that. I, one of the things I do as a hat, one of the hats is I am a surveyor for accreditation of breast programs. So I'm an NAPBC surveyor. So I go around the country and I've been doing this for 10 years and I survey programs and now survivor care plans is is a um, definite standard that's, that's needed, that's necessary. However, in the really practical, for those hospitals that are, are really just making their budget, it's difficult to think of a care plan team because they're making decisions that me may mean, do I get an oncology nurse versus someone who's going to do a survivorship care plan? And so it's become very difficult to mandate those resources. I do believe having a, a survivorship care team who goes through and talks about all of those issues and follows up with the patient and makes sure that they are well resourced. Um, is an important part. And I think many of the organizations that are, have oversight about that are trying to figure out how to do that best. I Thank think you. it'll be great when we do have care plans for all diseases, not And And I expect pathology. that there will. It is a standard in, in our accreditation, and it's a, a standard that's going to be a main part of the cancer center accreditations as well. Thank you. You're welcome. So I'm curious, you know, you've had your own patient experience. If since then you've had an experience where you thought sharing your own story with a patient might help that patient, and did you decide to share that story, or did you decide to not? And then if you did, how was that received? So um, one of the things, uh, because I was in the documentary Emperor of All Maladies, when patients look me up, um, they see that I am a breast cancer survivor. So oftentimes they will give a clue that they want to talk about it. Um, I, they'll ask me, how am I doing? You know, what my journey is. Um, how can um, I understand that you're a survivor too? And, and in that circumstance, if I think it's appropriate, I will share. I don't, um, and I haven't, that's one of the reasons why I was saying that I used to wear my hair to work, because it's not about me when I, I'm in, in with patients. But if I, if 
they want to talk about my experience, I'm very happy to discuss my experience with them. Nice. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.